Great honor to finally welcome Professor Antal Fekete in Vienna after a long time, a long while ago. He's been here as many Hungarians in 56, uh, many freedom-loving Hungarians. Uh, he had to flee his home country, uh, but he didn't stay in Vienna for too long. Was the impression that bad that you got at the time? I, I, all, I will always regret it that I didn't say, stay a couple of years in Vienna. I was just anxious to cross the ocean and get to North America. I was 24 years old, unmarried, independent, and uh, I wanted to get as far away from the Iron Curtain as I could, bad memories. But uh, I think I made the wrong choice, I should have stayed should have stayed. And actually, I was offered a job at a boarding school. And I even remember that this job would have paid me 900 shillings per month plus room and board, which means that the 900 shillings would have been just pocket money because I didn't have to spend for food and lodging. And I didn't take it and uh, I'm I'm sorry that I didn't sorry. I visited Vienna many times in between of course but the opportunity never came back and my experiences in Canada where I ended and I was teaching mathematics at a university the same university for 35 years were not uh, a very happy occasion for me. I, I wasn't happy at all. I had lots of negative experiences, but I'm not going to go into that. Let's keep this mm. meeting on a happy it's a, note. It's eine große Ehre, Professor Anton Fekete endlich wieder in Wien begrüßen uh, zu dürfen. Uh, vielleicht gelingt es uns durch dieses uh, Gespräch eine Verbindung, eine historische Verbindung wiederherzustellen zwischen zwei Schwesterstädten, die lange getrennt waren und sich heute ziemlich auseinandergelebt äh, haben. Äh, Professor äh, Fekete hat äh, lange Zeit in Kanada Mathematik äh, unterrichtet und das ist doch erstaunlich, dass ein äh, Vertreter der österreichischen Schule äh, ein Mathematiker sein sollte, also ausgerechnet dieser Tradition, die äh, versucht ohne Mathematisierung mathematische Modelle äh, auszukommen. Äh, äh, ich habe ja äh, selbst einen ähnlichen Hintergrund, äh, ich bin in der Natur, als Naturwissenschaftler, Physiker äh, begonnen und äh, für mich war auch das Erlebnis, dass wenn man äh, Mathematik beherrscht, dann eher etwas abgeschreckt ist äh, von der stümperhaften Art und Weise, wie sie in der Ökonomik verwendet wird. Also vielleicht war äh, das äh, bei äh, dir ähnlich äh, Anteil. Äh, Anteil I, äh, was uh, wondering you uh, taught for a long time is at uh, mathematics in, in uh, Canada and uh, uh, the Austrian school is not known for its mathematical models, uh, uh, quite to the contrary. Uh, was it your uh, exposure to mathematics that made you particularly critical towards mathematical modeling in economics or is it unrelated for you? Well, no, no, no. I actually, I am <coughs> very much interested in the philosophy and uh, I admire Mises for one specific reason. I may disagree with him on specific issues concerning money, credit and even gold, but I admire him for being a torchbearer of the creed that mathematics logic and economics are, uh, using his term, 
deductive sign. Uh, he had a, yeah, deductive, that's the meaning, but the word he used is a, a priori. A priori. The a priorism is a philosophical school, and it singles out these three branches of science. Of course, that was not new. Before Mises, Karl Menger established the school of Austrian economics on that principle. And that's the big lie. I just, it caught my eye. Historische Schule, the big uh, debate, Methodenstreit, right, between the historic school, the German school, who was the uh, big... Smaller. Smaller. Schmo smaller, smaller? Smaller. Smaller. And Karl Menger, the Austrians, and the Germans were just... A priori economics? What a naive thing. Now, I, I am... This is very close to my heart, you know, and I wish I had more time to write on this because this is at the very heart of our discipline, the philosophical foundation. So all this addition and what, what made mathematics so, so successful in uh, mainstream economics, Keynesianism, Friedmanites, and a lot of other branches is completely wrong and off the mark. And model, um, uh, manufacturing models, economic models on mathematical basis. And using differential equations makes my, <coughs> in economics, makes my hair rise because what is the meaning of human action the title of Mises uh, magnum opus the meaning is that it's the individual who makes choices and there is just no way that the differential equation can predict what choice I'm going to make or you or anybody else because if they tell you that you will choose A, then you can immediately refute them and choose B to defy their prediction. There's just no way a differential equation can predict whether you are going to choose A or B. There's just no way. It's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron, contradiction in terms. So uh, actually mathematics and economics are very close philosophically and uh, as far as I'm concerned I I think this is should be studied more and young people should get involved and spend more time in in uh, pointing this out and uh, there's a a lot of things. Well, of course, you can understand that I couldn't have made a living in Canada or in the United States if I was teaching economics, because my type of economics just didn't agree with the system. So I left the Soviet Union, no, I left the Soviet orbit in Hungary, where there was a man by the name Lysenko was a biologist or a uh, geneticist mm -hmm. and uh, he wanted to please Stalin and he uh, created a school which asserted that that uh, acquired properties um, biological or physiological properties can also be inherited. So uh, ag agronomists could change 
the nature of the animals they were breeding. And that would, you know, uh, let's not go into this. I, I grant Lysenko the right to preach his own gospel, but he did more. He had the power to arrest his colleagues and put them in the gulag and in some cases even killing them. You know, as saboteurs, if they did not follow his own brand of genetics. So I escaped from there and ended up in the West, the so-called free world, to find that I cannot make a living if I wanted to preach my own brand of economy, not my own, but what I the learned. Truth. <laughs> hmm? The truth. The truth. <laughs> the truth. The and, truth. Uh, and that is true. This was a very bitter disappointment. It took some time. Uh, I mean, you couldn't find this out overnight, that uh, <coughs> you, uh, you left the Soviet orbit and what is going on in the West, at least as far as economics is concerned, is basically the same. The only difference is that they don't shoot the dissidents as they did in Russia and in Hungary as well. But other than that, there was certainly no freedom of thought, freedom of doing research, and this is still true today. It's incredible. It's just incredible that, that we did not learn that much from the Soviet experience, mm -hmm. that we should really make uh, research free. It's not free. Also, Anton, hattest du den Eindruck, dass die österreichische Schule aktiv äh, unterdrückt äh, würde äh, und das bis heute der Fall ist? Hat sich das etwas geändert? Anton, do you have the impression that the Austrian school is actively suppressed, has been suppressed well, for a while and uh, has it changed? Well, uh, that would be an overstatement. I don't think that, uh, but it may come to that, because if the Fed realizes that we are predicting a calamity which is directly traceable to the Fed and the mistaken policy which the Fed has been doing for a hundred years. Remember, this is the hundredth anniversary of the establishment <coughs> of the Fed. Then it might come to that, that they'll pick certain people On, in the street and put them in prison as saboteurs. It's, it's not outrageous to visualize. I, I can see it. In fact, I'm surprised that it hasn't yet happened because now there are so many advocates, so many people who are predicting the Fed is destroying the world economy, either by printing too much money or printing too little, or setting the interest too low, setting the interest too high, is, uh, this is a policy which is very, very damaging to the world economy. And once they realize that the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, because people got wise enough to see that it's just hocus pocus that they can manipulate the interest. And, uh, you know, Keynes said that he's not worried that uh, there will be problems because he can always come out with a new gospel just like they, the world embraced Keynesianism, number one, <coughs> if that leads into disaster, 
Well, he will declare Keynesians number two, just like QE1, QE2, QE3, and uh, that will settle the problem. Well, of course, the man died in 1947. He wanted to live forever to do that, uh, but he didn't. So uh, we are just, we just have to suffer the consequences. It's very sad. Aber ich glaube so, dass Zentralbanken überhaupt eine positive Funktion äh, spielen äh, könnten, äh, ist dieser Versuch der Stabilisierung äh, vollkommen äh, sinnlos oder gäbe es da eine richtige Zentralbankpolitik? Äh, and how do you believe that the Federal Reserve or Central Bank could actually perform a useful function for an economy and what well, would it look like? Not as it is constituted presently. Because you know, they have, uh, in effect, unlimited power. And we know from older philosophers that unlimited power is not compatible with the uh, um, happiness and the liberty and so on of, of the... Uh, majority of the people. It, it benefits those who control power, but it could destroy the world and it could be very bad. So unfortunately, uh, the picture is not, not good. Wie müsste eine Zentralbank verfasst sein oder könnten wir ganz ohne auskommen? How would a central bank have to be constituted in order to have a useful function, uh, or would it be possible to do without any central banks? Now, that's a very good question, and I can see that you can argue both ways, that there is perhaps some residue, but it has to be under uh, very strict control. I mean, just think of the central banks as they were operating in the... 19th century. They were profit-making institutions and they did not have the, uh, the power they have today. So they had the constraint of the market. They had to react to market signals and uh, I think there's room for argument. I can certainly see that they are not absolutely necessary. Central banks are not absolutely necessary. But um, I could live with them if they behaved <coughs> like the central banks in the 19th century behaved, like the, the Bank of England. The Bank of England doesn't have the best pedigree because it was created as a bank to bail out the, the king who couldn't pay his bills. So in exchange for a monopoly of note issue, they raised a loan for the king to become solvent. Of course, the trouble was that They, they, um, uh, they didn't succeed for one reason. Originally, I don't know how well this is known, but it's an interesting thing to remember, that the original charter of the Bank of England did not allow the bank to issue notes in excess of one pound and five pounds. A ten pound note was no, no, it was not admissible. But it didn't last very long. The itch to print ever larger denominations was irresistible. So they ended up issuing. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, now that I'm traveling in the Euro zone, I have seen it any number of times in shops saying we 
do not ex accept 500 and 100 euro notes. Sorry. You see, this is a telltale telling you that people who are working for their livelihood in business, they realize that something is very basically wrong with the system because they can print notes. They can put more and more zeros after the one, but the market, the, without the guns behind, the people won't accept it. They will say, no, it's too big. And if there is hoarding of banknotes, it's quite clear that people hoard the small denominations, mm -hmm. five euro, 10 euro, maybe even 20, but already the 50. No, you change it and if you have 10 fives, you are happier to, because you know, if the system collapses, that's what people will need to buy medicine, food, clothes, the necessities. Forget about 500 euros, but already 50 euros I, <coughs> I wouldn't trust. Maybe too much trouble to spend that. Yes. Well, Zentralbank and das Bankwesen überhaupt wieder richtig ausgeführt haben, wurden immer wieder missbraucht für die Schuldenfinanzierung der staatlicher Kriege in aller Regel und heute auch des Wohlfahrtsstaates. Äh, wo ist dieser Sündenfall genau passiert und wie hätte er verhindert werden können? Uh, what do you think, Antal, was the original sin of the banking system, the central banks that permitted uh, the financing of uh, wars, uh, debt-based uh, wars, and how could this original sin have been prevented? Uh, what institutional arrangements would have prevented this abuse of banking and central banking? Well, I am in the minority of one, I think, who says that the problem started even before 1914, when the Fed opened its doors for business. Uh, and another year, which was very critical, was 1909. And that was the year when first the Bank of France, and in a few, a few days later, the Reichsbank of Germany, of the German Reich, declared the note issue legal tender. I think the parliaments, the parliaments did that, okay? <coughs> uh, so they legally, they over stepped their authority because they didn't have the authority to do that. It was not a matter of passing a law. It was a matter of changing the constitution because it's a very substantial change. It's very interesting in 1909, well, by the way, that was in preparation of World War One, because uh, the military and the civil service were paid in, in mostly in paper, not in gold coins. But the fact remained that constitutionally those were convertible into gold. They were not legal tender. And when legislation made them legal tender, this was an unconstitutional act. But, you know, when the shooting war starts, you cannot afford the give it, giving the freedom to soldiers or civil servants to say, no, thank you, I don't want your paper. Give me the gold. You can't afford that. So they knew, the politicians knew very well what they were doing. They were preparing for World War I. And, and here we go. If, 
if people realized what was going on and people uh, kick, would have kicked their... That was five years between 1909 and 1914. For people to say, this is unconstitutional, we don't go for it, and we kick out those politicians who advocate paper money. Not because of any sacred doctrines about money and gold and silver, but because our sons will be sent to be butchered in those trenches of World War I. And, and they were on both sides. And why? Because they gave unlimited power to the central banks of these two great powers. France first, that's a matter of record, France did it first. But of course the Germans were watching and they jumped in. They couldn't wait more than a couple of days. <coughs> I am reciting this from memory. But it was a very short space of time before Germany passed the same legislation as if they were acting in collusion. Of course they weren't. But just like uh, they were watching which country mobilized. If a country mobilized, a country like Russia mobilized, then of course Germany had to mobilize. Austria, Hungary had to mobilize. Because you can't afford to be one or two days later. It would have been disastrous militarily to allow that much advantage that Russia mobilized a week uh, no. earlier. So this was the same in the monetary field. If France declared legal tender of the, of the franc banknotes, then Germany had to do the same. And it could have, have happened in the opposite order, could have. But the fact is that it happened in this order, that France declared legal tender first, and Germany followed it. And the time period was very, very short. Now, how bad the educational system in those days was, and today it's much worse than that, <laughs> but it was very bad already, because you could have expected that the gold coins would disappear from circulation. Mm -hmm. The government of France, government of Germany, declared paper money legal tender. So obviously, if you have a choice to spend a gold coin or the equivalent paper money, you would keep the gold coin and pay with paper money. And you know something? This is not what happened. Gold coins stayed in circulation between 1909 and 1914. They disappeared from <coughs> circulation in short order after the outbreak of the war, the shooting war, you know, in, in July, August 1914. But people could have started hoarding gold. In, now, I, I completely attribute this to the educational system. People just thought that the gold coin is shinier than a copper coin or a uh, nickel coin. So it's nice to have, but, you know, it's, uh, after all, a barber's relic, as Keynes put it. So the, this is incredible. Uh, and as I say, it's, it shows the... Uh, the uh, poor educational system, which did not uh, teach children or even high school students or university students about the meaning of money and the role of the real role of gold. Uh, also, wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, es ist so, dass uh, die Geschichte des Finanzsystems, also eine Geschichte der Entmachtung des Bürgers, 
Ähm, ist das für dich auch der Hintergrund äh, hinter den Marktverzerrungen und auch der fe zunehmenden Feindschaft und feindlichen Einstellung gegenüber Märkten? Und würdest du europäische Märkte überhaupt noch als Märkte bezeichnen? Uh, if I understand you correctly, I think you regard the history of the financial system as a history of dispowering people and taking away their power as the consumer. This this empower this this empower here. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, yes. Do, do you think that's uh, the reason uh, why people are getting more and more hostile towards the markets because they perceive them as distorted to their disadvantage? And would you uh, consider current European economies as mar still as market economies? Uh, to, to a limited extent, yes. Um, uh, but I, I would keep coming back to the problem with education. You know, certain subjects are taught very, very poorly, and they have been for a long, long time. And one of them is mathematics, of course. And I think I can speak with some authority, having been a teacher of mathematics for 35 years. But uh, the very next thing is economics, especially monetary economics. And I think Menger, Mises, and the rest of them were very much aware of that. It's a formidable problem to... I mean, just take Schmoller, the historic school, you know. If uh, um, historically a model works or an experiment, monetary experience works, then it's, uh, it's truth its validity is established. Never mind logic, never mind mathematics, because history has spoken, and that settled the issue. No, that's... that's uh ja, nun war die Vertreter der historischen Schule nicht unbedingt ungebildet, aber ich äh, nehme an, du äh, wirfst ihnen eine Halbbildung vor, dass gerade vielleicht das Logische, was es in mathematischen und eigentlich in guter Ökonomie geben sollte, dass das gefehlt hat, also das grundsätzliches Missverständnis darüber, was Bildung sein soll, welche, äh, welches Wissen äh, wie zu gewichten wäre. Äh, certainly the uh, proponents of the historic school, they were not uneducated people, they were highly educated, uh, yeah. Uh, read, read a lot. So how it's come? Was it, uh, <coughs> is, is it uh, a flawed view of education, what education should be? Was it really a big lack, maybe of the humanistic tradition, uh, a big lack in the, in the logical and mathematical formation that uh, led to this one-sidedness? Well, uh, I'm, I'm often uh, drawing a parallel between two very great men. One is Aristotle and the other is Karl Menger. Uh, the setting was also similar. Aristotle mm -hmm. was the private tutor to the son of uh, King Philip Franz of Macedonia, Joseph. the future, oh. the future <laughs> Alexander the mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. he, he was the private tutor. Karl Menger was the private tutor to Crown Prince Rudolf of Austria, the son of uh, Franz, Franz Joseph. Joseph and Kaiserin Elizabeth. And apparently a very, very bright young man. Now, I could not find any weak point in Karl Menger's economics. But as far as Aristotle is concerned, you have one mistake after another, another, and not just in economics, but also <coughs> in biology and physics and so on. It's, it's really amazing. Now, why do I say that? Not just because here we are in Vienna, where uh, Crown Pr uh, Prince Rudolf was, grew up and was educated, 
by the way, it was not just a sitting type of tutoring by Karl Menger, because mm. they were traveling. First, they were traveling in the empire, visiting various parts, and then traveling in Western countries, Germany, France, England, and so on. So why do I bring this up? Because your question suggested to me that if somebody is so well established in Aristotle, then uh, we shouldn't really... It's, it's not nice to question or to find weak points in his science or philosophy. It's not nice. Well, that's a foolish attitude because I think we should be very critical no matter how well respected a philosopher is like Aristotle. Und sogar Ludwig von Mises, da bist du recht kritisch gegenüber ja. Ludwig von Mises, obwohl du ihn für einen sehr großen Ökonom, vielleicht einen der größten Ökonomen ja. hältst. Und die meisten äh, Denker, die Ludwig von Mises kritisch gegenüberstehen, meinen, dass die Fehler eben auf seinen Apriorismus zurückzuführen wären. Da bist du eine absolute Ausnahme. Äh, glaubst du, dass das nicht äh, der Grund und der Hintergrund ist? Also gehst du davon aus, dass auch... Äh, Karl Menger im Herzen ein A Apriorist war und was glaubst du war eigentlich der Kern dieser Revolution äh, durch Karl Menger und was ist glaubst du der Kern der österreichischen Schule seit äh, Karl Menger? Now, I'm telling you, uh, even quite critical towards Mises, the great Ludwig von Mises, I think you consider him one of the greatest economists. But uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises was a very modest person. Hmm. He would have been the last one to say, That's it. I have said so. And that's no more argument because I have, the, like the Pope, <coughs> speaking ex cathedra, he is infallible. Ludwig von Mises would have never said mm. anything mm. like that. He was willing to debate, and, and of course, he had so many. Uh, opponents who were easy to defeat because they were absolutely wrong. But Mises would have never said mm. that uh, he never he never made a mistake. Yeah. But no, mo think. most people now who are critical towards uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, blame his a priorism for his mistakes and claim that he has actually broken from Karl Menger, who would have been more empirical and. He called oh, himself causal is, realist. This, so this. you think that Karl Menger was at the heart an a priorist as oh, well? I am a firm believer that that uh, this is the case. Karl Menger never wavered. Well, after all, this was his great act to say that economics is like mathematics. It's not like reading tea leaves or pouring mm. uh, molten Coffee. lead at, uh, at uh, New Year's Eve mm. and uh, predict the future from that. No, uh, but the inner logic and the axioms, he could, you could derive all truth from a small number of axioms, just like in mathematics, just like in logic. and. If you make predictions on that basis, then you are not going to make a mistake. Because there are such things like the truth of the axioms, which can neither be proved nor disproved. Axioms are uh, the f foundation of a science, such as economics. <coughs> so. But that is also a limitation because you cannot predict what uh, the gold price will be tomorrow. There's no way, nobody can. If anybody says he, he or she can, then uh, this is a, 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 what's the word, a, Im, imposter who pretends that or any other economic fact 
to indicate uh, what, it will, what the interest rate will be tomorrow and so on. So this is the limit. It's not just that saying that, yes, you can make predictions on the basis of a prioristic science, but it's also a limitation. Because that doesn't mean that you can predict anything and everything. But you've got to have this deductive process, step from step to step to step. And if you have a chain of reasoning, then you can check if there was a mistake made somewhere along this. Otherwise, if you don't have that logical chain, then it's just mm -hmm. like reading tea leaves, pouring molten lead. Es, es drängt sich der Eindruck auf, dass Karl Menger sein Werk nicht vollenden konnte. Glaubst du, dass die Schüler nach ihm zum Teil falsche Abzweigungen genommen haben? In welche Richtung, glaubst du, hätte Karl Menger selbst die österreichische Schule weiterentwickelt? Und in welchen Bereichen, glaubst du, fehlt noch eine, eine Weiterentwicklung, vielleicht eine Korrektur? Uh, one might have the impression that Karl Menger was not able to finish his work. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. What do you think uh, would he have added and where would he have pursued uh, yeah. this tradition? And do you have the impression that the tradition of the Austrian school has been betrayed by some of his students? Later on, has it taken a wrong turn? Um, I, well, I'm sorry to say that the answer is yes. Because um, Karl Menger wrote very little about, for example, the theory of interest. And uh, this, I think, he did for very good reasons, because he was preparing himself all his life to put the crown on his life work. I, I cannot help but believe that he did have a, an idea how the theory of interest should be. <coughs> and he just didn't feel ready yet, and he was hoping that there will be a time later on in his life. And, and he, of course he had a son also called Karl Menger, spelled with a K rather than with a C, as the father spelled his name. Karl Menger, the younger, um, and he helped his father in his last few years right here in Vienna. I, I don't know which street they had their apartment, but it would be interesting. Perhaps you can find out, or the Institute can find out, and put up, up if there is not already a I would certainly make the pil pil pilgrimage to, to visit that apartment house. Well, anyhow, it turned out that the cooperation between father and son didn't work very well. And uh, chances are that the son was not up to the level of the father. He. By the way, I say this is a mathematician because Karl Menger, the son, Karl spelled with a K, was a mathematician. And he uh, spent the rest of his life after he went to the United States, I think, Michigan State, uh, University of Michigan, if I remember correctly. He was teaching mathematics to, until he retired, and uh, he, he just did not re reach up to the heights of Karl Menger, the father, which is very unfortunate. So the second edition of Grundsätze never, well, it did come out, but it was never uh, the thing which mm -hmm. Uh, the father. I cannot help but believe that uh, Karl Menger, the father, did have 
uh, a pretty good idea what the theory of interest <coughs> should look like. And uh, perhaps it's too ambitious if I make this announcement here in the city where Karl Menger lived and worked that I would like to finish that job. And uh, uh, we are working on a book with Johannes where I would present the theory of interest as I think Karl Menger would have written it if he had lived longer or if he had a son which had a, a deeper interest in economics. And uh, we are going to finish the job. It's, it's actually writ written, it just had, has to be uh, made seamless, the various chapters. So there's a little work to be done, but I'm determined that I'm going to, if I have the time and the health to finish the job, I would like to f finish it. And I won't call it my theory of interest. I will say this is the theory of interest as I think Karl Menger would have written it. And I will uh, give reasons why mm. I think that. Als uh, Karl Menger Kronprinz uh, Rudolf unterrichtet hat, hat er interessanterweise Adam Smith's uh, Bücher uh, verwendet uh, als uh, Grundlage. Uh, glaubst du, kann man Adam Smith als einen Vorläufer der österreichischen Schule bezeichnen? Murray Rothbard war sehr kritisch uh, ihm uh, gegenüber, hat das ganz anders gesehen. Uh, ich weiß, dass du sehr viel Wert auf uh, die Wechseldoktrin uh, von Adam Smith uh, legst. Uh, meinst du, dass das eine wesentliche Ergänzung ist? Ich habe sie bei Karl Menger nicht uh, erwähnt gefunden. Welche Rolle, glaubst du, müsste sie in der österreichischen Schule uh, spielen? Wenn Karl Menger was tutoring the crown prince. Yes. He was using Adam Smith uh, as uh, the, the workbook, uh, more, more or less. Uh, do you think Adam Smith can be considered a precursor of the Austrian school? And uh, to which extent I know that you put a lot of focus on the real uh, Bill uh, doctrine by Adam yes. Smith. Is it a necessary <laughs> addition to the Austrian school or would it emerge mm. naturally from the thought of Karl Menger? Because Karl Menger himself, he never explicitly referred uh, to the real Bill's doctrine. Uh, I'm not sure if this is quite true, uh, because you see terminology changes. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, real Bill is a pejorative term. It's uh, like the word capitalism mm -hmm. is a pejorative. Marx did not think that when he started using the word das Kapital, it was meant to be pejorative, demeaning, not, but mm -hmm. I, it backfired for Karl Marx. And I think it did backfire when, uh, when uh, an American economist Uh, Lloyd Mintz. This, he was the the uh, mentor of Friedman, Milton Friedman. He was actually his professor, and Friedman followed him slavishly. But Lloyd Mintz was not a very great mind, and he coined the word "real bills" as. Uh, a pejorative term and it became a well-established term but there were many others the uh, a, a more neutral term would be bills of exchange and if you really want to hit the nail on the head you would say bills of exchange maturing in gold coins because that's very important It's not just writing a bill when you take delivery of a good, the wholesaler delivers to the retail, you bills him and then you sign. No, this bill has to mature in 90 days in gold coin. 
Now, so because of there was a confusion, just what real bills are, different authors use the term in different ways. Therefore, the message of Adam Smith was not clear. But I think Menger knew, and there is this article um, and in the Encyclopedia of Economic Science, written by Menger, uh, the title is just one word, without uh, der die das, just geld, geld. Okay. Now there are three versions of that article, and I am talking about the last one. The year is 1909 and if you read it carefully you will see that Menger accepted everything what Adam Smith taught about this. Now today it's easy to throw mud on the name of Adam Smith because of course the very big mistake he made is the theory of value. Well, your institute is called... It's here for value-based economics. Va value. Now, what is value? Adam Smith said, and this was his big mistake, and it costs tens of millions of lives in World War I and the revolutions following it and so on. Uh, because uh, Marx took it over, lock, stock, and barrel, the labor theory of value, which was pr pronounced by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. And this was a mistake. So he, Adam Smith, yes, he did make a mistake which was a, historically a very bad mistake, uh, due mainly to Karl Marx, who grabbed it and yeah. ran with it, labor. So it's the working yeah. man, not the entrepreneur who uses his head. No, it has to be hand labor, which creates value. Forget about the entrepreneur. He is just an exploiter, exploiting human labor. Now, uh, a hundred <coughs> years later comes along Karl Menger, and he announces the value theory, which is based on marginal utility. And all of a sudden, it, bec it becomes clear that Adam Smith was on the wrong track. And we still suffer from it because Keynesians say, increase the GOP or uh, domestic uh, national product. It could be like... Um, filling empty Coke bottles with one dollar bills and burying them in a disused salt mine and pay workers to dig them out, you know? And that will increase the gross national product and it will increase the amount of wealth, you know? Of course, he said this with tongue-in-cheek, in but uh, it's all too clear that this, uh, this is just the wrong idea. But Menger did have the right idea, mm -hmm. and his uh, value theory is the valid one. And the marginalism, the yeah. school of the marginalist, is, is, uh, goes way beyond just the, well, as, as you are building on 
value. Uh, this is true for the rest of mm. the economy as well. Ah, weil da in Wien Weihnachten schon begonnen hat, erinnere ich mich an deine Warnung, dass du meinst, dass ein Goldstandard ohne äh, Handelswechsel und auch darauf äh, gezogene äh, Banknoten das erste Weihnachtsgeschäft nicht überleben würde. Warum glaubst du nicht, dass es möglich ist, durch äh, einfach die Ersparnisse der Händler hinreichend Liquidität zu halten? Und ist das aus seiner Sicht eine historische Beobachtung, dass das so nicht funktioniert? Oder eine logisch-ökonomische Herleitung? Uh, Antal, I remember your warning as we are approaching Christmas, that you think that the uh, gold standard without uh, bills of exchange that mature in gold will not survive the first Christmas season. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, now, since then, I have a better Uh, date. Not Christmas, but harvesting. Because when the harvest time comes, a lot of goods, agricultural goods, grains <coughs> and other products have to be moved mm -hmm. from the field to storage. And that takes a lot of financing and it's completely unrealistic to expect <coughs> that with gold coins in circulation you could finance that the system would break down <coughs> at harvest time the sheer quantity of goods to be moved from the field to storage and then distributed <coughs> is far too big There's no gold standard could st stand the strain which it would put. It would be a deflationary mm -hmm. strain. So what in fact happens, and that was already very clearly seen by Adam Smith, is that if the grain merchant <coughs> delivering the grain to the elevator, the, the bins where the wheat or corn or whatever uh, is tr stored to be distributed during the space of a whole year. Because under our climactic zone, there's only one harvest per year. Now we know there are other climactic zones And perhaps mm -hmm. they may not go for the 91-day bills. The re reason for 91 days is that uh, four seasons of the of mm -hmm. the year. <coughs> But so 365 divided by uh, four gives you approximately mm -hmm. 91. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the tropics. There are basically two seasons of the year, the rainy season and the dry season. That's just the mm -hmm. first approximation. Yeah. It's not, the, the, it's more complicated than that. But it could be that under this climactic zone in the tropics, it's not the 91 day bill, mm -hmm. but it would be the 182 day bill, which would have the greater marketability. Mm -hmm. because Or no bill at all, because there's constant harvesting of tropical fruits. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> And who mm -hmm. knows, in the future, mm -hmm. they may shift to different products, agricultural mm -hmm. products, to feed the mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. the hungry world. Mm -hmm. Until we could go on talking for oh, hours for, uh, and days maybe yeah. and weeks, <laughs> but uh, I think we have to make a stop here. I'm yeah. so grateful that uh, I hope the bond between Budapest and Vienna will be revived. Yes. And the intellectual yes, let's, debate let's continue. should Perhaps continue. Perhaps the next uh, meeting should be in Budapest. I'm very much and looking forward to that. And, and uh, we continue. So don't consider it as we finished it. Mm. We just made one small step and we would like to continue. Mm. Antal, wir können jetzt Stunden oder Tageweise 
äh, weitersprechen. Ich glaube, wir müssen zu einem äh, Schluss gelangen für dieses Mal, aber es ist kein Schlusspunkt. Wir wollen diesen intellektuellen <lacht> Diskurs zwischen Budapest und Wien aufrechterhalten. Äh, vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. Thank you very much.